And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, previously known as the creator of the Twilight Dream, which was, mi which was a mix of manga influences and Irish myth, and now bringing to us a bit of pulp science fiction into the realm of Dungeons and Dragons with the in the form of Galactic Anarchy, the one and only Nicholas Robinson. How you doing today, man? I'm pretty good. Thanks for having me. Thank you, thank you for coming back into the temple. So, Galactic, so getting hitting the ground running. Um, Galactic Anarchy is very much going for that for going for that pulp um, pulp science fiction approach with some space opera elements. Um, now it would be as tempting as it would be to say to to bring to bring up to bring up Star Wars. Um, what was your introduction specifically to pulp science fiction? Uh, to pulp science fiction? Yeah. I believe the first, like... I mean, aside from just, like, getting it filtered through other sources, the first, like, real pulp sci-fi that I read was John Carter. Mm -hmm. Um, And then from there, there's a lot of other... Uh, kind of doing research into other uh, other stories on the subject and uh, other characters and whatnot. Mm -hmm. That was the first one. All right. Now, when it comes to oh, when it com when it comes to you mentioned filtering, getting it filtered through other sources. I'm assuming you're referring to st to stuff like Star Wars and. St and more contemporary approaches to that whole, to that particular style of science fiction. Yeah, like um, how it's appeared and how it's influenced other forms of the media, mm -hmm. like the uh, the 3D animated Clone Wars, Star Wars, where they kind of introduce every episode as today we join our heroes Obi Wan Kenobi on every episode. They've got that kind of uh, pulp feel to them. Mm -hmm. um, in the in the old um in the old in the old serials for the Phantom, they would always open it with for those who came in late. Yeah. Uh, although I I will admit I will admit that a lot of the, a lot of those characters, whether it be the Shadow, whether it be the Fa whether it be the Phantom, whether it be Flash Gordon, or even um, John Carter, a lot of them have had a much better run of things in comics these days. Yeah, they have been coming back a lot. Um. It's probably better than some of the uh, original material. <laughs> in some cases. Yeah, I'd say I'd say in I'd say some some cases more than others. And of course, I've I've been a I've been a fan of Conan for the longest time, and that's had and that's had phenomenal runs in comic books for decades. To practice getting your brows lowered as far as possible. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I've e I'm even one of the rare people who will defend the. To the, the 2011 movie. I think a lot of people give that movie shit because of the fact that it isn't trying to do the um, Arnie Conan, mm. which would be a reasonable would be a reasonable expectation if they were actually doing that. Yeah, I think that's what most people think of it when they think of that, like in a movie. Even even though the Conan in the books and the Conan in the comics has almost nothing to do with Arnie's version. No, uh, it's like I was saying. He just looks always very serious. Just he's def he's definitely described as sullen in a in a lot of in a lot of the books. Um, but that's not to say there's no blow of all. Of all these different factions engaging in a bit of a gold rush for this for this unexplored territory, the same way there was a the same way there was a gold rush with the American 49ers. 
Yeah, something like that, where everyone's trying to go out for this um, ideal treasure. I, I guess to draw from another sci-fi influence, mm -hmm. it's kind of like everyone going for the vaults in the Borderlands. Yeah, just, with, just is... without the drowning in memes. Yes, without all of the early 2000s memes. Or just all, or just all the or just all the memes. Period. Yeah. And the and the most disappointing boss f boss fights of its generation. First, okay, yeah, first one. That's fair. <laughs> um, sec, second and th second and third one. Well, I haven't played the third. I haven't finished the third one, so I can't comment on that because um, boss fights are good. Um. Well. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. Gr it took a while for me to even grab Borderlands Three because I, because of the fa because of the fact that that was one of the rare cases where I would con I would consider sailing the high seas for the game simply because of the DRM involved. Ah. Now, for those who are playing it on console, that that's um that's not going to be as much of an issue for them. But that that that's that wasn't me. I'm somebody who will mu who would much rather do mouse and keyboard over doing controller. It's not that I can't, it's a matter of um preference. Yeah. But give but given the, given that, I think I think we I think we should open into into the into the five factions that are that are going to be are, that are going to be taking place. There are a lot of minor factions obviously, but the big 5 I think I think are I think are where the where a lot of the moving and shaking is going to happen. So, right, yeah. the first one I'll start with is the Cabal. Yeah. So the Cabal are kind of your uh, mad scientists, uh, alien abductions, uh, great old ones. They serve the great old ones, Cthulhu and the type. Mm -hmm. They're kind of drawing from that type of pulp. And they do a lot of... Uh, well, less than moral <laughs> work out there in their service of the various uh, great old ones. And it's only the fact that they all serve different great old ones and are all kind of unsure of one another that's kept them from being able to actually conquer anything as like a united force. They're like uh, like the deep ones. They're mm -hmm. essentially fish folk that live in space. Now... The, and I, I the ne the next one would be the Covenant. Yes, uh, they were, um, or come from, come from the uh, worshippers of what is now a dead god, mm -hmm. who was responsible for helping to seed much of the sector and parts of the universe in like its early history, and she sacrificed herself in battle against the early cabal, against the early great old ones to save. Uh, her people, but in the process ended up fracturing the bond she had created between them, the psychic bond she had created for her people. So today, they're still kind of interpreting her messages that have had enough power, enough force of will they've carried through time and space. Mm -hmm. And the, th the third would be the Horde. Yep. Uh, Horde, best explained with chainsaws, fire... Claws and bombs, ships that look like a muscle car, everything painted red. Uh, some of the fiercest fighters you'll find, but they've also got a very strong code of honor like in their territory. And they, uh, despite being some of the most prolific pirates, they are quite secure if you're actually in their territory. You're mm -hmm. under the protection of the local alpha. Mm -hmm. And the next one... The next would be the Sakura League. Right. Uh, so they're essentially futuristic mega corporations, kind of like mm -hmm. what you might find in uh, Shadowrun. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like hover cars, everything made to order, chrome, lots of sleek, glowing lights, Apple tech kind of looking buildings. And uh, they're from an old colony ship where they originated. All right. And lastly would be Sovereign. Right. Uh, they are the descendants of the original uh, god-king Space Alexander the Great, mm -hmm. who conquered this place. 
and they're kind of themed around his old empire, especially like the Near East. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of elves in that faction, they're trying to uh, retake what they see as theirs. And I got, I gotcha. So, and now, like, like I said, there's a, there's a lot of um, a lot of a lot of minor factions, which is why I'm not getting not getting into them because I think that I think there are let's see one t at least in the preview document I saw one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen minor factions. Are you reading the Gazetteer? Yes. Oh, that's planets. Well, <laughs> that would that would help. Yeah, that that would that would certainly help. So, my, my okay. Uh, I guess that some of those do it. Some of those do have factions, though. <laughs> all, all right. Um. But that br <laughs> that brings now. The key th now the key thing with this particular air this particular area uh this Al the Alexandris Alexandris sector is that it's separated by a by a uh, massive storm known as the Tempest um but the w but um I believe the way you the way you have it the way you have it described is that is that it is essentially a is essentially a space maelstrom that recedes every one every once in a while. Yes, it's basically like a big space nebula mm -hmm. of like gigantic proportions. It will occasionally fall back far enough that people are able to go into those territories and search for treasure for the civilizations and the ships that didn't make it out last time. Mm -hmm. Now one of one other avenue that you're that you're bringing in to this particular setup, especially get, especially given the given the shift in setting, is the Matrix, which you've made you've likened it sim to be similar to the Feywild. So I'd be curious how it's similar and how it differs. Right. Um. So it's similar in the sense that it's a liminal plane where you can cross over to it and it kind of overlaps with the other planes, kind of like the Ethereal um, or the Feywild or the Shadowfell, how you can find it pretty much anywhere, and you can potentially use it as a jumping-off point into other uh, into other planes. There are powerful AI there, the gods of the AI, and powerful ones among them, who function kind of like Archfey in the way that they shape their individual pockets of the Matrix. Mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily like a pocket dimension, they have their domains over this realm of shifting data where they can bring it into line. Um, the Matrix is kind of, it's split into three tiers, essentially. The first one is what you might see in virtual reality. It's uh, pretty common to be able to get there with like headsets and such. The second level above that is the afterlife for AI. It's where they go when they die. And the third level beyond that is where their gods reside, which is kind of like a celestial AI. Mm -hmm. And the next one, the now when it comes to the, I think when it comes to the Matrix, the key the key thing that I find that I find myself asking is it is because a, a lot of times when people see that they they'll end up thinking of the whole massive interconnected web, web approach a la Shadowrun. But the approach that but the approach that you're going with is not, is not exa is not exactly not exactly as se as separated if I'm getting it. Um kind of I, I mean yeah, it's basically just like a separate plane mm -hmm. in the, like the D and D set. It's something that you'll be able to interact with more frequently. Like there are some creatures, kind of like yeah, the um, I think the phase spider. Mm -hmm. You can go into like the ethereal plane. There are creatures. There are things like that. You kind of cross between the two, mm -hmm. and rather than just being pure data, like it's something that only exists through electrons or something that only exists inside a headset. 
it actually exists as well. Mm -hmm. Separately. So, like, what you experience if you were to enter the Matrix physically, and someone were to just, you know, punch your character in the gut, and you came back out, you'd still be like, oh, that's good, that's good, nice hit. <laughs> so, uh, it's a little more real, I guess. Mm -hmm. I'm like strictly data. Yeah. Or as I think in that setting, if someone gets kicked out, um, there's a I don't remember if it's sliced or whatever. It's jacking in to go to the matrix. Yeah. But if, yeah, when they get kicked out, there's like a uh, a clash where it's essentially hitting their nervous system. Mm -hmm. in that setting. This is more like, no, it literally happens to you as you thought it happened. Yeah. Oh. Um. Now, and with with that and with that in mind, you'd, I'd like to delve into some of the new options when it comes to when it comes to race and class that are getting added into the into the setup. And I'm I'm guessing that it, I'm guessing that the that the the SRD friendly races are still going to be compatible. Yeah. Or are there or are there any that might be pushing it? I mean, they should be fine. Mm -hmm. I. Generally, like rebalance everything, which kind of goes for how I did the health and damage thing in general. Mm -hmm. Which um, we'll yeah. probably we'll probably get to that. We'll probably end up getting to that in a bit in a bit. But I'd first like to go into the um, the new races that you've that you have for this project. Sure. So I'll start with the Ardani. Right. Um. So the basic concept behind them was uh, Space Dwarves. They're deep rock galactic sort of dwarven asteroid miners mm -hmm. uh, out there. They've got some magnetic abilities just from their uh, natural environment. Rather than living underground, they live well a lot closer to space. But uh, essentially Space Dwarves. If you know dwarves, you know mm -hmm. what they're like. Oh yeah. So next would next would be the Eidolons. Right. Uh they kind of have a more tragic history where they were seen as being the ideal uh workers for this company that took them and started messing with their DNA and making them more like the uh, uh, have you ever seen, like, Abe's Exodus games? Yes. Yeah, it, it's like that, where they basically treated them like that in their company. And they have, quite thankfully, many of them since broken free and reclaimed a bit of their roots. That's probably who you would most likely be playing as one of them. Mm -hmm. The remainder of them remain um, trapped working for the company as kind of their mindless army of clones. Mm-hmm. So they have got a bit, bit of tragic backstory built in. Mm -hmm. So ne next would be the next would be the Gyatari. Yeah. Um so they're your kind of insect uh insect, plant, fungus, kind of like the fusion or blending between the different life forms. Mm -hmm. But they have, uh, their appearance is generally like a cross between insect and kind of fungus. Mm -hmm. It's just how they're constructed. Um, forearms let them do quite a lot of stuff. I know that they're recently bringing out the uh, Thrycreen mm -hmm. in the official setting. This, I believe, is different enough. It'll offer a different perspective, and it was separate, like this was not based on them. Uh, this is more from various um, space settings. There's usually a four-armed bug folk, but mm -hmm. they a uh, bit of fun, because there are two uh, sub-races for them have some of the greatest differences between the others in like the different uh, new races. Mm -hmm. One of them is more like a grasshopper ant, and the other one is like a big beetle. It's mm -hmm. not a large creature, but it's on the larger side for what you can expect. Which I, I can certainly get. I can certainly get behind that. 
Um, the ne the next one the next one on the on the list would be the jet, spelled with an e. Yeah. Uh, so that one comes from uh, Wajet, the Egyptian kind of uh, snake goddess protector. Mm -hmm. The idea behind some of their abilities, to, like not getting surprised. Um, essentially, they are kind of like the Naga. Mm -hmm. or, actually, no, I think Naga in the official setting is more like a snake. But yeah, yeah, eat the picture. Snake folk, or humanoid, from about the waist up, and they're amphibious. And ne next, the um, Rakaku. Oh, the Rakaku, yeah. They were... We kind of worked with that one for a while and working with some of our uh, artists about what exactly we wanted them to be. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of based off lemurs for their base body type. And they've also got a bunch of other small mammal things involved in them. Mm -hmm. Kind of uh, fox, mouse, that sort of thing. But they are a uh, social... People. They like living in groups with one another, mm -hmm. and they can be quite expressive, and I, I hope people will have quite a lot of fun with them. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes... Now, because of the fact that the Riven are described as, be as being made of magic, um, I'm somewhat reminded of the Ganassi from, for from um, Forgotten Realms. Is it something similar to that, or is, it not, or is that not quite the case? They're, um, like, what's the word I'm looking for? Not thematically, but they originated as being something closer to, like, the Aetherborn from Magic the Gathering, where it's more like they are magic energy that's in a shell. Mm -hmm. It's kind of held together. And if that shell were to break, it would be quite dead. But, I mean, that would be pretty much true of anybody, yeah. Mm -hmm. Break your skin shell, <laughs> but um, they have that connection to their original plane before they got separated. But they, yeah, they're essentially living magic. Mm -hmm. Now, the now uh, the next that I the next that I have is the um, Sephiri. Right, that would be our version of space elves, basically. Um, with some key differences, they don't have as much in common with their ancestry, mm -hmm. and in order to live for the, you know super long periods of time like elves do, they rely on a substance called dust, which is extracted from the life force of other creatures. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot more aggressive by nature in order to stay alive. Mm. But, uh, like, the average person isn't. The average person doesn't have access to that sort of stuff, but it's something like the oldest members of their society, the oldest and most powerful, maintain their super long lives by doing that. Mm -hmm. But the average people don't do that, but they also have a very different... Uh, so there's not, like, a, a monoculture, but this... Especially with Safiri, who are part of Sovereign, where uh, many of them are found, they have... Um, relationship with death, where they basically continue to serve on, in death, kind of like the uh, uh, Egyptian afterlife, where you continue in the role you had in mm -hmm. life. And that brings me to the title, to the um, Talion. All right. Our robots. They have a morph ball, which was fun to get that to work. <laughs> <laughs> uh... They're kind of based on the uh, Hangar from Monster Rancher. Mm -hmm. It's originally how their body can kind of come apart in places. and But they're more of a synthetic... They're synthetic, but they have a blend with like organic uh, elements in their body, which is why they can still be poisoned, which is not something, something to still be aware of, even as a robot. Um, would it be fair... Would it be fair because of, because of the I was I was going to ask if they, if they'd be if they'd be more akin to cyborgs but I don't I don't think that I don't think that would work unless you're dealing with um terminator style cyborgs No, it's more like 
they have blood. Not it's kind of like uh, the Vex from Destiny. Mm-hmm. They've got that organic fluid flowing through them. Through them, mm-hmm. kind of like, kind of like that, but kind, kind of. That's <laughs> never really explained that fully in there. So I'm gonna go with kind of. <laughs> All right. Uh, and lastly, when it comes to races, there's the Theron. Big apex predators. These are essentially lion, wolf, ape combined into one. Mm-hmm. Um, they look functionally like werewolves, kinda. Um, they've got a lot of natural abilities with like teeth and claws. Mm-hmm. Um, most of them are found with the horde, because it just gives them the opportunity they need to express themselves <laughs> through violence and big guns. Mm-hmm. But they're also quite um, quite good as adventurers. And if you've got one of them watching your back, I mean, they'll be able to just clap you on the shoulder, give you a good shake, mm-hmm. and run into battle. They're someone you can trust at your side. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, when it comes to classes, if I'm not mistaken, you have... Um, there are... you. In the gazetteer, you have five classes that you're at, that you're adding, and I'd mm-hmm. I'd like to go I'd like to go in, into a bit of those into what the general theme you're go, you're going with, especially especially given some of the things that you brought forward with the Twilight Dream. So, right, yeah. the first one I'd like to go into is the Avatar. Okay, um, Avatar is kind of our take on the Druid. Mm-hmm where you've got one side that's more related to like the power of the planets mm-hmm. and the elemental forces of creation. So it's um, drawing up into that state of it's like elemental archon. Mm-hmm. And the other side of a druid, because they both kind of rely on a Gaia totem, which is how they uh, pick up information about spirit or uh, different creatures they meet. Mm-hmm. Since it's uh, being on multiple planets, it's a lot difficult than having different biomes, or strictly biomes. But the other side is the symbiote, which is not exactly Venom, but it's kind of a line where you run into that or uh, an alien, like a xenomorph. Mm-hmm. Because like they have the ability to uh, potentially walk on walls, spit webbing and such. Mm-hmm. Um, very different take on biology as either this primal force of nature or this like ever evolving space horror creature mm-hmm. using its powers for good, presumably if we're controlling it. Mm-hmm. So, so next would be the Galactic Ranger. All right. Um, <clears throat> that's our version of the fighter. Mm-hmm. They are. Uh, pretty much your colonial space marine. Mm-hmm. Um, they'll take care of, take care of most problems with a wide array of different gadgets they've got. Something I wanted to give a lot more options than just having fighting styles, mm-hmm. especially when it comes to um, fighter in space. It's more of someone who's prepared. For any sort of contingency, who's able to go toe to toe with you know, whatever because they have the training, they have the weapons, and they have the gadgets that will let them get the job done. Mm-hmm. And the n- the next one would be phantoms. All right. So that is a rogue with um. A lot of invisibility, mm-hmm. you know, baked into it, but it's a lighter invisibility than just the pure sort, because that's something you have to be very careful about balancing. Mm-hmm. Um, they rely on staying hidden until it's the right moment to strike, kind of like a predator in the water knowing when to strike their prey. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're kind of inspired, at least their abilities are inspired by like the classic scoundrel Han Solo. 
thing. I, I believe one of their abilities says people can't seem to hit you no matter how hard they try. Mm -hmm. Just kind of lean a little bit to the right and they can't shoot you. <laughs> uh, and then also uh, powers taken from the Tempest itself being able to um, morph the storm mm -hmm. around you when you're invisible and such. Mm -hmm. oh. And ne next would be the Technomancer. Right, that is our um, reality warping warlock. Mm -hmm. Pulls on the powers of the Matrix to change uh, everything around them. Um, and one of them focuses more on that, more on drawing on the Matrix, while the other mm -hmm. one is more on their uh, relationship with little drones that they have following them around. Mm -hmm. uh, that can do all sorts of useful things. And that kind of started as the um, uh, from Slave Aspire. There's a class called the Defect. Mm -hmm. It's got the little orbs around it. It kind of started like that. Where I was thinking of like, okay, so I can have it do three orbs, but that didn't really work well with D and D. Mm -hmm. So it went to more of a uh, more like a summoning mm -hmm. ability. And le and lastly would be the. Titan. So, these are your barbarians that have got their power drawn from the Titans, who stole the power from the gods, mm -hmm. kind of like in Greek mythology. And their two versions are basically your Conan the Barbarian, mm -hmm. uh, your Primal Lord, and the Space Marine. Like the 40k Space Marine. Mm -hmm. Big armor, heavy, or heavy armor, big guns. So very different ways to be a barbarian. Yeah. Would you um would you say that the Doom that the Doom Slayer would count under that as well? Yeah, that'll be fair. It's basically just you are the unstoppable force, just kind of walking forward. Mm-hmm. Heavy armor. I got I gotcha. Yeah. So so with that with that in mi with that in mind um one of the, one of the key things that you, that is brought up on the Kickstarter page is is the is the is the use of the spell system from the Twilight Dream. Now we had di we had dipped into that the last couple times I had you on, but I think it's I think it's important to have a bit of a refresher as to how that works before we get into how it's going to work within um Galactic Anarchy. So, um, for the Twilight Dream, and then for this, I completely uh, redid the spell system for this. Um, spells are now down to five levels, but you can cast a spell at any level that you for which you have a spell slot. And spells get stronger for every level you cast them at, as they would. But for every level above first, you can add a modifier, and modifiers are unique for every spell. So the example I give, I believe it's the one on that page as well, for Fireball, is at first level, it's a Fireball. Explodes, you know, uh, X feet of fire damage. But you can give it Twin Fireball, where you shoot two separate Fireballs when you cast it at second level, and then you divide the damage dice between them. Or you can give it Magma, where it leaves behind a pool of Magma that damages anything that steps in it. But at third level, so, again, for you get one modifier, and then at third level you get a second modifier. You can combine both of these to shoot two fireballs, leave two separate pools of magma for some really good crowd control. Um, so it's up to you what you want to do, how you want to customize your spell. Uh, every time you cast it, you can kind of decide, this is what I want to do for this situation, and it lets you have a ton of flexibility and interesting options for how to use your magic. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I should mention also that there's also martial, uh, mm -hmm. arcane and martial spells, mm -hmm. so that the fighter, the barbarian, they have spells just as much as the as the other classes do, mm -hmm. because it's just raising their uh, physical abilities, typically, or physical abilities or what they can do with their bodies and their weapons. Mm -hmm. And I believe I I believe the way you have it written out is that um 
is that up um, leveling up leveling the casting of spe of spells, regardless if they're arcane or martial, um, is isn't a, isn't going to be a static upgrade. It's a case of you 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 increase this level and you're able to put improvements on the spell, kind of giving kind of giving each spell its own little um, package of meta magic. I kind of I mean you can cast a spell at any like at any level that for which you have it. So like if I want to first level fireball, third level fireball, as long as I can do it, I can I can do it. But yeah, and then I can choose what upgrades I want whenever I cast it. There are some people I know who would prefer to like write it down so they know they're always getting like there's only one modifier they like to use. Um, but you can change it to whatever you want every time you cast it. Mm -hmm. Oh. And that that brings that brings me to that bring that is going to bring up an interesting question since you had you had mentioned or you had mentioned earlier that the that the um I believe it was the te the technomancer is some is somewhat analogous to the warlock um and in the and one of the key, one of the key thi one of the key things that makes warlocks so appealing probably why they have such a high pick rate. Is the fact that they always cast spe cast spells at their maximum possible level. Um, so with with that in mind, how how do you how do you maintain that that warlockness while still being able to have that degree of um spe of variance with spells? Since I d I doubt you're doing the uh, whole cast spell at ma cast spell at max thing for the technomancer. Uh, no, we are not. At um. For starters, we just borrow their uh, proficiencies, equipment, mm -hmm. and such. Mm -hmm. um, that's like an, on a superficial level being the same. But it's about how they feel for like the equivalent of um, like having a different packed boons and packed magic. Uh, the different options you've got for using your core abilities, which is something that I like using for everything overall giving people the options in different ways they can use their uh, characters. But kind of, again, they're just having uh, the, ver uh, the versatility for their core abilities. Which I think is something that also really defines uh, Warlocks. Mm-hmm. Or no. different kinds of Eldritch Blast. Oh, oh yeah. Um, and get and given the, given that since since we since we made the mar, we made the um marine ex, mar, marine comparison um how would you how would you differentiate some somebody somebody who's 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 got who's got a handful of who's got a handful of of combat weaponry as a galactic ranger versus as a, a titan that um just like if you got two of them right next to each other. Titan yeah. is usually, uh, okay. So Titan's usually, but not always, a little bit bigger. But their abilities have the uh, astral chains. Mm -hmm. They can manifest those to uh, wrap around enemies, and they've got a lot more kind of like descended from celestial powers, like a demigod that has been placed under restrictions, trying to. To unleash that power, where if they're for temporary bursts, not exactly like going into rage mode like a barbarian normally would, but they have uh, rage dice that they can use for a number of different things and a way that they can break their limits temporarily. They are thematically all about breaking limits, um, not being contained, and just being this primal force of at all. Uh, the rangers, by contrast, are typically more about abilities coming through discipline, through training, and just through um, compared to I guess they'd be more like analogous to like a space mercenary, but mm -hmm. it, yeah. Yeah. I I can I can certainly go with that. Um, 
with the now with that with that particular um with with that particularity in my, in mind, um. Is it it given the given the whole uh, the whole um the whole spell list setup? Since I'm pretty sure you're going with the same with the standard five E approach of each each ca each class that can cast, so which is going to be all of them in this case. They each have their own individual spell spell book. Um, you mean like each oh like number of spells they can? I'm. I mean, I mean, in terms of each one of them having a list of spells that they that they have, they have that they have oh. access to instead of the, instead of a shared list of arcane or martial spells like it like in the old days. Uh, it's pretty open. There's some that are restricted, mm -hmm. like only available to a certain class, but mm -hmm. otherwise they're pretty open to take, um, whatever is for their class. So like anyone who's arcane, anyone who has arcane as their type can take arcane spells. And Marshall can take Marshall, and then if you're both, you can take either. But then there is a limit to how many you can take. Mm -hmm. and nobody will be able to take. Every, nobody can be a jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. Now, with the with that in mind, the other um, the other thing the other thing that you're that is brought up on is brought up on the Kickstarter page is. That is the way health and, is the way health and damage are go, are going. Since you want to make combat faster and deadlier, how yeah. how does that manifest itself within within the rules that you have? Um. So for starters, health on most creatures has been brought way down, but it still takes. It's a little bit faster to kill things. Um. But if something has like four hundred hit points, that mm -hmm. that is quite a lot in this. Uh, that'll take quite a, a lot of firepower to bring that down. Um, damage also has been brought way down, which means typically rolling fewer damage dice. I know some people like rolling a lot of damage dice, but mm -hmm. you can get um, still really good damage out of your uh, out of your results, and there are ways that you can add more from like doing uh, a martial spell that adds d6 per level of the spell you put in. Mm -hmm. You can still still roll quite a lot. Um, and in order to make it feel more consistent with the damage you're doing, the dice have a special rule, where when you roll a six-sided die, a result of one through three is a three. Mm -hmm. An eight-sided die, one through four, is a four. Mm -hmm. So, essentially, there are no bad rolls when you roll for damage. You can get an average roll, but... From there, you get a 50% chance of getting average and 50% chance of getting each individual one over. Mm -hmm. But if you get a 6 or an 8, that still has the same percentile chance of occurring as it always does, as a 1 in 6 or a 1 in 8. So it still feels good to get max damage on something, but you never feel like, like man, we got this hit! Let's get this huge fireball, roll 5, d8, and the 1s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that doesn't happen as much. So it feels... Um, feels better in that regard, but also because the damage numbers are consistently a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. It means things typically die f it, with higher number damage and less health. Things die a little bit faster without needing to roll all those dice. Yeah. Now, what I something I do find I do find interesting is in is um you is you decided to bring you decided to bring in flanking, but the but the uh, but um instead instead of it instead of rolling with advantage you're gi you're giving a flat plus two bonus right i believe that's in like the alternate rules for the uh, for the dm's guide has mm -hmm. that in there yeah um it's it it, it is it's ju it's just that in in their in their in their version it in their version it was um it was adva it was advantage not a not a bo not a um flat bonus right i i mean like that's what's in the maybe a, an alternate mm -hmm. but i found that it usually it's just a little bit more consistent mm -hmm. um of course um one, I I do get a kick out of the fact that se that second wind is a is something that comes standard. That's something that that's something <laughs> that I you there was there was I um 
I was very I was very critical whenever whenever somebody would said second win is in fifth edition. It's it's a it's a fighter thing. That is not second wind. It may have the name second wind, but that is not second wind. That was not the purpose of second wind. <laughs> I know I know I, I know it's a, I know this is a case of 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 um, of me being too cr me being too cruel to the devs, but um. We hold these truths to, to be self-evident here in the temple that all men are cremated equal. Whereas the the um, second wind that you ha that you have pre that you have present in in um, the preview for Galactic Anarchy that is the proper one. Getting your uh, temporary boost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe fifth edition. It's written as like you get an extra act. No. No, you get you. That's action you first. get you get a sh that was that's action surge. You get a short you get a short pool of it. I think I think it was like d ten d ten plus a modifier, which um, at lower levels is great. Right. At higher levels, when you're when you're gonna, when you're going to be having a ridiculous HP pool, not so great. Right. That's the one I'm thinking. Yeah. It's really handy low level though. Mm -hmm. Unless you get a one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, like, because the whole the whole point the whole point of second wind or he or healing surges back and forth was to was to reduce was to reduce the heal bot problem, where the cleric is where the cleric is just sitting back being the being the healer instead of actually contributing. Mm. And by, by contribute, I mean act, I mean actually d actually dealing actually dealing damage, hitting um, things. Mm -hmm. And with the, with that with that particular thing in with that particular thing in mind, um, when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to health advancement, I'm guessing that's largely this that's largely the same. Yeah, it's what it was in Twilight Dream. Um, the other the other thing that I'm curious about how it's changed how it changes is um is the way you're the way you're treating skills versus the way they're treated in vanilla. Right. So for that we've got three skill levels. Mm -hmm. You've got the proficient, uh, expert, and mastery. Mm -hmm. And uh, with expertise you have a pool of expertise dice that you get, and you can essentially roll those to. Um, get advantage on that particular roll. Um, I can use my exact wording here, so I'm not misquoting myself. I'm gonna unplug my fan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ah, get my exact numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Um. Yes, so that's exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. So essentially, it's what you used to have. Um, uh, not expertise. Actually, no. What is called expertise in the base mm -hmm. for like the rogues have expertise. That is what mastery is. You can add your proficiency bonus twice, and then expertise just has a pool of dice which are based on your proficiency modifier, your proficiency bonus. Um, which you can uh, roll if you. Uh, I'll just read this exact. You can use this before or after rolling the dice, but before the DM declares the outcome. Um, just wanted to make sure I quoted on that, especially when it comes to like anything with numbers. I don't want to misquote myself. <laughs> so I know that's the sort of thing that'll come back to bite me. Yeah, and that now that pr with what was the reasoning for going with that whole um, that whole tiers of. Um, skill instead of the whole proficient and not proficient approach. That, uh, partially because it worked with the skill training system I had, and partially because I liked it more as a system of progression, where you had more ways of growing as a character as opposed to just being able to do more damage. There are ways that you can like you can say, well, I'm better at survival now than I was two levels ago. 
or there are ways to advance that don't just involve killing things which just gives you just more ways to play generally and just gives you a especially with health and damage numbers being a little bit lower it helps give you a sense of progression on your character in that you might have liked to see from just like seeing numbers go up mm-hmm. yeah now obvious obviously if we're going if we're, obviously if we're going to be dealing with um space science fiction um and there would be I would be remiss if I did not bring up ships. Cuz I brought this up with the last time I had co- I had covered science fiction meets fifth edition and and another project. Yeah. So um do you have do you have ships set up like like they're like they're a type of character? Uh kind of it, it's more like they have their own stat block. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. Um, not exactly what they did for the vehicle rules in Descent into Avernus. I found those quite, weren't quite enough, what I was looking for generally. And they didn't really give you the ability to customize uh, the ship as much as you should like. So, kind of, but they don't have like a dedicated uh, character sheet, necessarily. But you could certainly make one, if it helps like to visualize your ship. Mm-hmm. But they have a number of... Uh, different points where they can be customized with different weapons, different uh, interior and whatnot. And they would definitely have their own dedicated area. But um, spend a lot of your time in ships, even if you only use them for going to destination, destination. Um, and the space combat, which at some point you'll probably run into it. Even if you're doing your best not to get into space combat in this game, at some point, it's going to come to you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's enough pirates, there's enough war going on. And um, this system is basically built to simulate dogfights in space. It's mm-hmm. what people think of when they think of Star Wars, the ships being close to each other. A- as you uh, had said, either a dogfight space or a submarine fight. Mm-hmm. And this would be more like the dogfight side, where it relies on your strategic positioning of your ship relative to the enemy. But we introduced, um, initially we had this, you fight on a hex grid, but it needed something to be more strategically engaging because it's difficult to flank something when you're talking about these huge distances and huge speeds. A lot of the stuff you do in like terrestrial fighting in D&D just, just doesn't work at that scale. Mm. Um, so to help make things more tactical, introduced the uh, every ship has a weak point you have a power core that has to be vented off into space it has to have this energy radiated or you will explode or very bad things will happen to your ship if you keep it locked up Mm. so this presents a structural weak point on every ship ever made out there it's not always in the same spot on every ship but like all ships of the same model will have it so it's about how you position your ship to take advantage of your opponent's weakness while protecting your own weak spot. Because ships have a set of dedicated rules, for damage especially. Um, it doesn't look like they do a whole lot of damage, even just for the size of their guns, like 2d6 or 2d8 damage for most of them. But the way the weapons are worded, they're basically on a higher caliber than like terrestrial guns. So anything that doesn't have um, we, use, we use a system from ACR, Armor Class Rating, and APR, Armor Piercing Rating, mm-hmm. which is basically if you have higher ACR, then they have APR, so if you have heavier armor, then they can pierce, mm-hmm. you take half damage, period. But if you have lighter armor, then they can pierce, you take double damage. And if a creature doesn't have any ACR stat listed, which... Most don't, because they're creatures, mm-hmm. and they take double damage. They're just assumed to have zero. So even though this weapon is only doing 2d6, if you take a 50-foot spaceship and shoot its autocannons at a goblin, it's going to be 4d6 damage. And with less health than before, it's probably going to one-shot that goblin. Mm-hmm. I should hope so. Yep. Uh, a little bit of overkill. And... Yeah. When... When it com- when it comes to when it comes to get when it com- 
when it comes to that sort that sort of creature design, given what given what you mentioned about about how you're handling armor, I'm ge I'm guessing I'm guessing you're not you're not gonna have it where a lot where a lot of monsters have have ridiculous high D, have ridiculous high DRs where you need to roll you need to have the luck of the dice gods in order to land some decent hits in. Yeah, not usually. I tend to put uh, AC a little bit on the lower end compared to what they have. Mm -hmm. Um, and then damage as well. But it tends to work out. Yeah. And one particular question that I often a that I often ask, especially when you're dealing with e with contemp with with contemporary onward um, settings, is how is how you how you balance out. Um, melee weapons and ranged weapons to make sure it's not a case of guns ruling everything. So if somebody wants to do their fantasy of the space swordsman, they can still pull it off. Right. Um, so first off, damage is generally lower, about the same uh, as what you'd expect from uh, ranged weapons in D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. But range is a little bit higher, but it's not like even though it would be more realistic to say, like, you've got a sniper rifle effective to a range of a thousand feet or something, mm -hmm. um, you don't generally. Um, it's assumed that either everyone has some sort of protective armor against that, or um, basically setting hand wavy mm -hmm. that lets it happen in much the way that uh, traditional D&D Still lets you use longbows and swords. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the I'm now grant now granted um, the balancing factor for for a lot for a lot of ranged weapons has always been the has always been the whole reloading thing. Um, right. You know, fi fire the fire it then then re then reload it then re then repeat. Um, but obvious obviously with with repeat with repeater weapons and the like, you can't really do the, you can't really do that. Um. So, so how so instead of instead of that, how have, how have you handled it? Is it a case where you hand where you hand wave, the that particular that particular resetting of the weapon. Sometimes there's like a set amount before they have to reload. Mm -hmm. Um. Just like kind of like a clip. Um, also certain things you can do with ammunition, like spend more ammunition to get a better shot. Um, I mentioned some of them by name in the preview, but I don't believe I actually list any of the weapon stats. Mm -hmm. But there is a list of different weapons, uh, new weapons that are being introduced with a lot of different properties that will hopefully provide a lot of strategic opportunities for people who want to use a lot of different guns that let you feel different. Uh, using a sidearm as opposed to using a hand cannon, mm -hmm. Just borrowing that term from Destiny. But I mean, it, it's true. I think Star Wars uses that too. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it's like a different. In much the way that you would have um, variety or a difference between weapons, mm -hmm. melee combat, you can get about the same thing uh, with range. But some of them do still have the reload property. If that. Um, like say if their damage is particularly high, that is still a tool I have for mm -hmm. balancing them. And I'm I'm guessing when it comes to the ones that would have that would have that kind of thing, we're you're talk we're talking things like rocket launchers, things like things like um things like sniper rifles, the th the things the things that the heavy weapons guy is going to be carrying. Yeah, uh, we also have some converted mining equipment. Mm -hmm. That's a laser made for digging through asteroids. Works great on pirates too. <laughs> great. Now, now, I've, did you ever play? Did you ever play a a um a little game called Rebel Galaxy? I've heard of it. Yeah, I um, I ha I, I remember going through that and how even though its range wasn't great, the mining laser, which you could use for both combat and for well mining, was very OP. <laughs> <laughs> To the point that you could tear you could tear through whole ships in seconds with that thing. <laughs> I mean, you'd have to get cl you'd have to get close, but that's but that's not hard that's not hard to do. So it'd be easy it'd be easy to just zoom by and do hit and do hit and run tactics. Guys, uh, did the ship get shorter? 
Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the but but um, uh, give given that there's one there. It's funny you mentioned Destiny because there's one other avenue that I that I wanted to cover, um, and that is the presence of en of energy based weaponry. Now, do you do you have it where and where um, energy weapons just or energy damage is just a different damage type, or or are there certain rules that apply with we with energy weapons versus um, physical ones? Generally. It's about the same as like mm -hmm. if you found a magic bow of fire arrows. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've got a gun that shoots fire, and we do have that, like flamethrowers, mm -hmm. fire damage. Um, there are certain things that will take advantage of that, but it's not like. Um, okay, so like in the Fallout series, you've got the different kinds of armor. You've got like the energy armor, radiation, physical, mm -hmm. poison, because of the four damage types. Um. In some cases, we would use something like that, but generally speaking, the rules as written work pretty well, mm -hmm. just for using a damage type. Yeah, and when it comes now, I have I have to ask I have to ask a a bit of a dumb question given given the, given the weapon listing. Um, I get the feeling. I get the feeling that there is at least one incarnation of an energy sword in in the thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and now for now for the dumber question: Do you have energy shotguns? Just shooting energy. Yeah, just or... shoot. Just shooting. Just shooting energy. I mean, we could. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd just be force damage, basically. Well, give, well, given how given how it's really hard to dr against against force damage, I can see I can see that being useful. Yeah. Oh. You know, like, uh, what is it? The disruption gun from Time Splitters. Yeah. I um. Yeah. As some as somebody who as somebody who who gr who grew up with a lot of '90s shooters and we and before beforehand we had talked about um we had talked about Ratchet and Clank. I feel I feel like. <laughs> Bring invoking ridic invoking ridiculous ridiculous weaponry is a must for something like this, which is why which is why I brought up that kind of thing. Plus, um, shotguns are shotguns are always a must. Um, <laughs> yeah, we do have regular um, shotguns. Oh, uh, I mean, I'm not I'm not a, I'm not asking you if you have I'm not asking you if you have any equivalent to the BFG nine thousand or anything like that. That's not happening. Yeah, no Groovatron or anything. <laughs> Uh, Not yet, anyway. Good time. Well, <laughs> the Groovatron the the Groovatron would just be would just be a ma would just be mass compel from a bard. Yeah, that could be done. Um, <laughs> and speaking speaking of that, when it comes to when it comes to the um, more SRD friendly classes, are there do you have plans to put in options to? To allow to allow them to integrate into into the casting system that you have for this. Uh, at present, I don't have anything written for that right now, but mm -hmm. I certainly could. Um, just be along the lines of what I do for balancing creatures. Mm -hmm. There's a short equation I use for balancing uh, damage and health. Well, actually, only my health needs that. Damage is pretty straightforward. Um, but there was a conversion listed in there, mm -hmm. and for spells or for uh, using spells for the traditional classes, they're mostly okay. Once if you apply the same thing to like health and damage, it should work. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely meant or it's definitely built to be used with these classes, but um, kind of like what I did with the Twilight Dream, mm -hmm. there are enough options and it is open enough that you can put in whatever creatures or whatever classes you want mm -hmm. uh, you just need to go through a conversion yeah although although one um i am cur i am curious if there if you have any if you have any um rules planned when it comes to customizing weaponry because we we look at a, we look at a lot of a lot of um weaponry in in sf and 
there's all there's inevitably that one person who has who has who has their gu who has their gun ridiculously tricked out. Um. Yeah. Um. There is something. There was something I'd done. Uh, started a while back for like a custom game, mm -hmm. where you had different items you could customize or put into your weapons and armor to give them different stats. Mm -hmm. And the way I did it then was basically every plus one you put onto a weapon or armor, you could give it some sort of modifier based on how you constructed it, mm -hmm. which is kind of like what you do for, I do for spells and how you modify them. So that's kind of the idea, what I'd like to do. Mm -hmm. um, and it again kind of fuses or blends the uh, sci-fi magic. And I think it's a little bit easier to get into than like using uh, hard points, which I think is what um, I think both Shadowrun and the Star Wars one use that. Um, now Starfinder has massive list. I believe that is the literal way of describing <laughs> their weapon system. So there's like every single different level of fire gun has a name in the list I've seen. Um, yeah, because appar apparently we didn't apparently we didn't exit chart hell back back in the nineties. <laughs> it's a lot of names. It, I mean, it's nice if you're a DM and you really want to get that. Uh, you know, like this is the volcano pistol, and you go, "Oh man, volcano pistol!" That I know what that means. I think it's going to do exactly three d eight extra. But um, that's a lot to keep track of, and they're different for every single damage type. Mm-hmm. So, um, again, on the one hand, that's impressive for, and if you want that, but I find that for most players, prefer a simpler system. That's most players I've worked uh, played with. Well, that and um, when it comes when it comes to say when it comes to say fire pistols, if the difference between them is is going to be just the damage dice, um, that's not going to be all that memorable. Hmm. Like, I'd rather have something more like this fire pistol also lights them on fire, or this one summons tiny genies that run the length of your gun, and I don't know, or, Buffy well, the, or something. There's a there's a re <laughs> there's a reason why whenever it comes to discussing crazy weapons, I always bring up things like the noisy cricket from Men in Black. <laughs> Go a good twenty feet backwards. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's it's going it's going to it's going to, it's going to wreck the shit of out of whatever out of whatever's in your way, <laughs> but <laughs> you're but um you're, but you're gonna you're gonna be knocked backwards in the process. There are um, strategic reasons for that. Mm -hmm. Um, of course I've I think I've already told you about the story of the up button, but that wasn't a weapon that was a trap. Um, Which. It 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 was a rune trap. You step you step on the thing. You go up. You're tr oh. if you want if I want to get technical, you're treated as if you cast fly on yourself straight up at forty miles an hour for six seconds. That is that's definitely up. <laughs> and um, well the well the the culmination of the whole thing was went was when a dragon in in the in the bottom of a dungeon stepped on that button. The DM was the DM and said. That's not gonna. That's not gonna work. He, he, there's a ceiling in the way. Does um I, I didn't put a ceiling exception when I made the thing. So. <laughs> it, so it's gonna. It's going to think he go up. Even if there's something in the way, he still go up. Pretty big crash. Um, it was less of a crash and more of and more of what would happen. More of what would happen if you put if you put a if you put a dragon into a hydraulic press. <laughs> that's one way to end that. <laughs> that. That's um that's one that's one way to end the that's one way to end it. Oh. Um, <laughs> but. With but now with with that in mind, when it comes to when it comes to space when it comes to um space combat, since you're going with the whole dogfighting thing, how is how is that rep? How do you represent that without it get, without it getting too crunchy on on the map? Yeah. Um, so the map's broken down into hexes instead of a grid, mm -hmm. and each hex is 
uh, approximately about 500 feet across. Mm -hmm. So your speed, the average ship is about 5 or 6 speed for how many uh, hexes they can move. Yep. And then you can move into any space in your front arc, so you can't just move uh, freely, as you like. You kind of have to follow a curve, which does help with the strategic planning. And you're like, okay, so I can go around here and get around behind this guy. But at the end of your movement, you can pivot mm -hmm. to face a new direction to shoot. As most weapons have to be shot from the front of the ship. Mm -hmm. And we use normal initiative. So um, most of the time that works about like a normal, uh, normal encounter. Because mm -hmm. um, even a few ships can be quite dangerous. The way I did health for them, ships have build points. So each build point is 10 hit points. Mm -hmm. For every 10 damage you take, as it kind of adds up, you lose a build point, and it carries over to the next one if you took more damage. Uh, hit points can be restored by specific actions and by essentially healing the ship, but build points cannot unless you get back into a dock at, or get somewhere safe and can expend the pieces and have the right tools to fix the ship. So, uh, even a short encounter can be quite dangerous if you're not paying attention and you're letting your ship take too much damage. You may have come out. You might have come out of that okay, but you lost half your build points. So the next time you run into another space fight, like, okay, we have to be really careful about keeping this ship alive. Mm-hmm. Oh, and we. When it comes to when it comes to taking damage, if if there's certain some some games I've seen will do will do certain it will do certain damage related events if you if you end up taking if you end up taking too much of a beating, you know systems going on fire, klaxons klaxons flaring, all that all that good sh all that good stuff. Do you have mm. something similar to that? Ah, uh, some of that is just kind of DMs flare, mm. not if they want to do it. But certain effects will do that, yeah. Yeah. Um. Sp um. Specifically, um. Uh, in some in some more specific cases, it's an instance of certain, um, certain functions of the ship getting dis getting disabled. Obviously, yeah. weapons is is the clear one, but there's other, but there's other cases. Is yeah, that... kind of like. Yeah, it'd be kind of like either taking a critical wound, or some other serious damage. Um, again, and to like to one extent, it's something that the DM can uh, say, like if you take a critical hit, mm -hmm. because uh, you don't roll uh, damage. Or, sorry, you don't roll attack rolls for hitting another ship. Mm -hmm. um, because between magic and technologically assisted weaponry, ships flying super super fast and being very small, relatively small targets on that, it just isn't. Something that would uh, make a lot of sense to do that. You still roll AC for like, uh, or attack rolls for like other targets. If you want to shoot something, the spaceships are going so fast, you don't do that. So critical hits are something that helps put some variety into that as well. In addition to, uh, if you hit someone in their core, in their weak spot essentially, then they take double damage. Mm -hmm. No matter what their armor is anywhere else. So that can be very effective if you've got a missile. To bring over there, and I'm, I'm get, I'm guessing, I'm guessing that when it comes to sh when it comes to ships, your your that same that same weapon customization setup that you had, you're likely going to be doing something similar when it comes to customizing ships. Yeah, something for like main weapons, mm -hmm. and then for the other tech aboard the ship, it uses something like our spell system. Um, but without the. Uh, without necessarily using the modifiers, but more like uh, just having to just up to the five spell slots. Mm -hmm. The main use for that is shields, which come baked into every ship. You can spend one of your slots to do that to negate incoming damage. Uh, right now, I have it in the preview written as you gain temporary hit points, mm -hmm. but um, I might rewrite that as just negating damage because of how temp hit points are written in the book, that means that you can't gain more. So if you just put up your shields and then you got shot again, that would... Um, it doesn't protect you very well from getting shot multiple times, so I'm, I'm going to have to rewrite that one. Just because of how D&D &D rules are as written. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, some stuff like that. Like mm -hmm. Generally speaking, I, I like how everything's 
running, but there's some specific I had discussed before, like I need to make sure that every ship says it cannot be frightened, it cannot be uh, poisoned because it is a spaceship. But you do have to write that down because there are things like that that if you don't double check that information <laughs> can lead to some very interesting situations. Mm -hmm. Now, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count for the project? Um, I think it'll be a little bit over 200, um, just based on the size of the Twilight Dream, mm -hmm. which ended up being significantly larger than initially planned. But this one should be shorter, um, because that one had seven classes, this one has five. Mm -hmm. And in a few ways it is different, but the... We're not doing... Like, that one has a dedicated section to running the specific bad guy faction, which is very important to that setting and to running adventures set there. Mm -hmm. uh, well, this has the uh, factions quite important. Um, there isn't like a single antagonist that's the DM is essentially running against them, uh, baked into the setting. They can certainly make one, but uh, it's more uh, like how you would make a villain for your campaign, a little more open ended. And it's likely that whoever they find as their antagonist might be whichever faction they happen to tick off. Mm -hmm. So. That'll be a little bit smaller without that dedicated section in there. Um, ritual mag magic is a little bit different. So just, again, based on uh, based on that one, I think it should be shorter than that one. But I think 150, 200 is probably a good, good estimate. Mm -hmm. Find out. Uh, inevitably, I'll find something that I really want to put in there later. And not like new uh, subjects. Like I already know what all the chapters are going to be. Uh, they're already listed in the preview, and I know the basic outline I want for the book, but sometimes there'll be something I find where I'm like, man, that's a really cool creature idea, or I really want this kind of ship in the in the game, and so I'll put that in. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I'm kind of giving a range. Yeah. And I, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it, de how it develops. And you you know you know me well enough to know that I always keep a very very close eye on things. <laughs> uh, no, I don't. No, I don't have a satellite in the sky. Yet. <laughs> and I'm Working not sure. I, mean, if, I figure I figure if I'm gonna dress like a Bond villain, I may as well go all out on it. You know, just just Finger. trying to. You know, set. Set a set a bit aside so I can so I can have a so I can have an island base somewhere or even an, or even an underwater base. Yeah, why not? <laughs> oh. but with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Yeah, thanks for having me. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here. Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, Stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>